Welcome and thank you for joining us again with Pilgrim Publications Presents. I'm Larry Wessels, your co-host with Bob L. Ross, the, the director of Pilgrim Publications. Bob, good to have you here as usual. Well, I'm enjoying all these series of programs that we've been having and hope to be a profit to people. Yes, and uh, as our viewers have been watching, they, uh, the ones that have been watching us regularly, that is, they've noticed that uh, we've been covering a particular topic in this series, a topic called uh, Campbellism, basically, and it's based on a debate that took place between my co-host, Bob L. Ross, and a Church of Christ minister, Mr. Bill Jackson of Southwest Church of Christ, back in January of 1991. It was a four-night debate, two hours a night in the debate itself, uh, followed by a question and answer session. We've been showing that debate in its entirety with no edits, showing the, the whole gamut of everything that took place, but it was almost 10 hours of debate footage. And so you can't really show that in one big glob, I guess. You, you, we've been kind of spoon-feeding it uh, spoon feeding it to our uh, viewers uh, piece by piece so that they, they get some here and each week that goes by it'll eventually get the whole thing and uh, tonight we're, we're covering the last night of the debate we're pretty far along in this series now we uh, it's a Friday night January the 25th 1991 Bill Jackson's getting ready to go up there and give his first speech on a proposition for the debate in fact I ought to read that for you. The proposition that's being covered here and Bill Jackson's in the negative, he'll uh, give a 20-minute speech and it covers the proposition, the scriptures teach that one who has believed in Jesus Christ as Savior according to the faith or believing, according to the faith or believing, specified in passages such as John 3:16, 18, 36, etc., is no longer under condemnation for sin, is born of God spiritually, and is a child of God prior to the act of baptism. That last phrase there is key to this whole thing. Prior to the act of baptism, can you become a Christian before you're baptized? Can you be a son of God, adopted into the family of God, and will be able to see the kingdom of God before you're baptized? So uh, Bill Jackson will come up in the debate clip that you'll see shortly. In the negative, he'll be denying that you are a child of God, a Christian, and so forth before you're baptized, that you have to be baptized in water to be saved. And of course then Bob will come up after that in the footage you'll be seeing and he'll be answering a lot of things that Bill Jackson said in his negative and be bringing up other points that weren't mentioned before. Now uh, before I get into this I just wanted to mention briefly that uh, my co-host Bob L. Ross has written several books on this subject one reason he's probably in the debate itself because he is knowledgeable on the subject of Campbellism and Church of Christ history. And he's written three books, Campbellism, It's History and Heresies, The Restoration Movement, and Acts 238 and Baptismal Regeneration. All three of these books deal with the Restoration Movement or in other words the Campbellite histories and its movement and its doctrines of baptism and so forth. He's also has done many uh, videotapes now. This is just one that we have. The Church of Christ, tr the, the church, the true church or cult. It's two-hour footage of, uh, in fact, uh, I found it to be some of the most interesting. If you're, if you're interested in where did the Church of Christ come from, their history, teaching, and stuff like this, you find that this, this videotape has two hours of the most intriguing information on the Church of Christ that you'll find. And it, 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 uh, stars, you might say, my co-host, uh, Bob L. Ross, and Dr. Robert Morey, along with Pastor Charles Bullitt. And uh, this video, among, among many others, are available through Pilgrim Publications, along with many tracts and other information. This one's Defenses of Instrumental Music. Uh, the Campbellites, a lot of them anyway, they hate, they think you're not a Christian if you use a musical instrument in your worship service, so no pianos allowed no trumpets, no, no anything, you know, you just got to sing a cappella, I guess, or something like that, and that's the only kind of true worship there is. I do find it interesting that they do use uh, sectarian hymns <laughs> right. and uh, what they, people they consider non-Christians, yet they sing their hymns, but uh, anyway, that's another story altogether. But what we're getting into tonight is uh, the debate footage you'll be seeing shortly now. Uh, just to lead us into this, as we've done show after show after show, is this chart that we have up here on our easel. Uh, 
This will lead us into our topic, uh, give you a little basis in case you haven't seen this series before or even know what we're talking about. But it comes down to these guys, Alexander Campbell, Walter Scott, uh, supposedly they're the true restorers of the true church. And it comes down to their theory of interpretation on Acts 2.38 and a few other passages that they bring out. And uh, they interpreted this passage a certain way, make a long story short, basically you've got to be water baptized to be saved. In order to have your sal salvation, you must be water baptized. As it says here, in order to obtain salvation, you must believe the Bible as these restorers have interpreted it for you. Otherwise, you go to hell. Okay, so this gives you a little basis. This is where the Church of Christ guys uh, are coming from. These are like their, their daddies. The, <laughs> they, founded the, they founded this Church of Christ movement. And the importance of this discussion, this debate, comes down to what we mentioned again and again, the divine curse mentioned in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. The Church of Christ believes that their water baptism gospel is the true gospel. And if you don't follow it, you're not a Christian. And we read in Galatians, it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which that ye have received, let him be accursed. Anathema in the Greek, one of the strongest words of condemnation you can use. So someone comes along perverting this gospel and gives you another gospel, they're under the divine curse of God. So this brings this issue of the debate that will be before you very important. Is baptism, water baptism, uh, key and instrumental and essential for your salvation? If it is, we want to know. I mean, this is, uh, we don't want to go to hell, right? So uh, this brings us up to some other uh, things we'll, we'll, we'll get into. As you get into debate footage, you might mention, you might hear Bill Jackson mention Calvinism and things of this nature. And he'll say some things, and maybe some of our viewers aren't really into heavy duty theology that much, and they won't really understand what he's talking about. But I thought a scripture verse that would make it clearer would help in this regard. And it's Ephesians chapter 1, and these are just several verses that are really, you can read the whole chapter here, and you can read many other chapters, Romans 9, you can read just, really it's all over the Bible, we just picked these few out just to try to give you a little understanding of what, what's going on here. Ephesians 1, I'll read it quickly, and we'll move into our, our subjects at hand. Scripture says in First Corinthians, I mean, uh, in uh, Ephesians 1:4, for He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Now, this is talking about God choosing people before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in, Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which. He has freely given us in the one he loves. Okay? In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Not our will or our baptism or our keeping this law or not using a musical instrument. It's according to his will in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. So when you hear this Calvinism, a lot of times it comes down to predestination. And are you, were you saved by God's will and, and sovereign choice before you, you, you were even born? I challenge any of you out there, read Romans chapter 9, starting around verse 11. And you'll find a little uh, example there of uh, two twins being chosen, one's elected and one's not, before they're even born, before they've even done any works. And there's many other passages we can go to from there. But when you hear that word Calvinism, basically that's what Bill Jackson is, is getting after. He's getting after this idea of predestination and God choosing people. But as we've just read here, right out of the scripture text, it's all there. Predestined, uh, choosing, the pleasure of his will, and, and so forth. But I, I just had to give that as a preface. And I, uh, I also want to say this in that conjunction, that subsequent to the debate, I have been challenged by Mr. Jackson's uh, associate who heads up the School of Bible Studies over there to a debate in January of 1992. Mm -hmm. And he wants to debate the matter of the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and you were mentioning uh, the Calvinism concept. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that's a nickname for doctrines, which we don't mind being identified in a lexical way to, for that distinction's sake. Mm -hmm. Not that uh, Calvin is the father of the doctrines or that we honor him with any special honor beyond any man, but the point is we believe that the Holy Spirit does an additional internal work to the gospel and the word itself, whereas the Church of Christ doctrine is you just have the word and there's no internal influence other than the word by the Holy Spirit. So they really deny the internal workings of the Holy Spirit, and as you pointed there to the passage about the uh, calling and the, uh, well, you Good know, the creation, well of the create, our being created in Christ Jesus and so forth, the purpose of God that works according to his will on that chart. Uh, all this is comprehensive of the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet they deny that work, and I think this accounts for one of the marks and characteristics or attributes of the Church of Christ denomination or church. If you've ever been into any of their services, you can just sense the real lack there of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I hate to say this of a group that's professing to be Christian, but frankly, I just sense an absence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, I, I go along with that from my own personal experience because I used to write for a Christian magazine called a Christian, well, it wasn't called a Christian, it was called a Believer's Guide, it was a Christian magazine. And that was several years back, but I used to deliver a lot of those things at different churches. And I remember driving by, past the Southwest Church of Christ. This was back around 1984, so we're going back a while. But uh, I hadn't stopped there. They weren't on a regular list, but I figured, well, maybe they'd take some free magazines. And you know, I went on up there, and I got talking with some of those people. And they're supposed to be Christians, and I didn't really know much about the Church of Christ back then. You know, I was yeah. kind of ignorant about them in, in, in the sense of what their real doctrine was and things. And... Uh, and I got talking with them and stuff, and, and I eventually talked some of them into taking some of the, the things, but they had to go review them first and all this kind of stuff, so they weren't going to put them out until they looked them over. But uh, just talking with those people, it was uh, the very thing you're talking about. Now, that's more of a mystical feeling type deal, but I definitely experienced it that night. I felt like, man, I get the same feeling with these people as I do when I'm at a Jehovah's Witness mm -hmm. Kingdom Hall or, or a Mormon ward or something. You know, when I'm out there witnessing to those people, I, I try to go well, and witness to the cultists. I've often said and mm. thought that uh, it is the most spiritless religious group that I've ever encountered, and I'm mm. not speaking here exclusively. Mm -hmm. uh, individually, there are some that may be different, but as mm -hmm. a total group, I've read their magazines, and I seldom ever have found anything in there of a real spiritual quality. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of a uh, theoretical, cut and dried, and overwhelmingly controversial, right. and sometimes even into the area of personalities that are s divisive over things. Well, in my own opinion, I just, you know, as I've quoted many times in, our, in this particular series and in other shows, I, mm -hmm. I use 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 against them. In my own opinion, I think they are spiritless in the literal sense. They really do not have the Spirit of God. And that's why they come well, up with all these Pharisaical works well, righteousness Anyway, doctrines. back to the point, uh, Mr. Brown has challenged me to a debate. And uh, we have been negotiating up to this point and I think that it will go through and hopefully we'll have a debate in January of 1992 and we will have more to say about those particular scriptures that zero in on the fact that there is a work of the Holy Spirit in conjunction with or in additional to mm -hmm. uh, the gospel itself. The gospel is one thing, the Holy Spirit is another. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that the power of the Spirit has to accompany oh, of the course. gospel. Of course. Now with our time flying on us here, brother, let's just cover a few points. We've got a few charts up here. We've got so many charts we don't even know what to do with them all. but. Uh, we're talking about the Church of Christ. One of the, one of the points uh, made by the Church of Christ people are really down on denominations. I'm sure the Church of Christ could tell you what to do with these charts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I'll ask them, but uh, uh, you've got a chart here on asking the question, is the Church of Christ a denomination? Right, I had a little booklet somewhere here by that subject. I'm not the, uh, actually, uh, is the Church of Christ a denomination? Oh, you have to. By V.E. Howard. There, now we got it in there. Right and uh, 
In yeah. this tract, he says that Campbell obeyed the gospel. Of course, he'd have That's a on hard, page 25. He'd have a hard time proving that. But this is a tract by a man named V. E. Howard, who is a radio speaker for the Church of Christ. And uh, I'll not take time to really delve into this so much, but I just wanted to show that title is consistent with this title. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I had challenged in the debate, Mr. Jackson, name one thing which is essential to being a denomination, which is not characteristic of the Church of Christ Church. I can't recall if he even answered that question. Well, see, I showed from the Articles of Faith that he submitted a creed. He mm -hmm. submitted... Uh, uh, the various requirements that every church is required to submit and then in the debate he defended this as being just like what other churches do. Baptists do it, Methodists well, do it. You can show me how to president. And, and so on. <laughs> and they have those officers. And uh, so I want to know if they're not a denomination, what do you have to do to become one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Really? And uh, so I challenge Mr. Jackson to name one thing which is a central qualification for being a sect which is not true of the Church of Christ. And then I challenge Mr. Jackson to name one thing, which is central of being a cult. That is not true of the segment of the Church of Christ of which he is a member. Now, they took the United Pentecostals of Church to task, the United Pentecostal Church to task, and the spiritual sword, and all of these points... Okay, it's Alan, down here, it's down here. Right, that Alan Hires wrote okay. against the United Pentecostals. Every single one of these things is applicable to the Church of Christ. Those were alleged restorations. Well, they allegedly restored the church. It was defended as scripture. Well, they defended as scriptural. They elaborately quote scripture. Well, so does the Church of Christ. And then scriptural support in the aftermath. Well, that's where the Church of Christ was. Examine their early history. Well, we've done that. Not till 1827, till the gospel was restored. Well, he's got over here in 1913 was when the UPC claimed some mm -hmm. restoration. Then the restoration movement divided over issues, like the UPC divided. Mm -hmm. Men's defense now does not make it a scriptural doctrine. And so anyway, every major point that hires used against the UPCs, we could use on the Church oh, of Christ. Of course. Now with that said, let's move on into our debate footage right now, and then we'll come back and sign off. Thank you. Mr. Austin, gentlemen, moderators, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad that I can be with you, that I might have then the first denial in this speech and let me express my thanks for the participation of everyone. I certainly hope that everybody has gained from our studies. I have gained, and more than that, I get that free set of Spurgeon's uh, uh, sermons. Do I get that free bookcase with that that sometimes they offer? I'll be glad to pay the postage on that set of Spurgeon. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we finally got him sidetracked onto the Bible somewhat. After all of these nights where he hadn't had any scripture, I think his restoration train rounded the curb and he got thrown out of the cab and he ended up sidetracked to the Bible of all things. And uh, it may be pretty good on that regard. Of course, it took him 13 minutes to get around to saying anything about his proposition tonight. But at least he has put forth something in regard to the scriptures. He gave me this commentary. He certainly wanted to see if I could find something in it that I would agree with. Romans 6 and 4, we are therefore buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life and then on page 649, the churches of Christ salute you. I hope that you're satisfied with, uh, with those things that we found there. He hadn't noticed that, apparently, in all of this time. He made the statement he never, up, uh, never offered a public challenge to anybody. Well, I don't know that I'd brag about that if I thought I had the truth of God and error is all around me and people lost and going to hell that here I said, and they've got to track me down and jump on me and stomp me and then offer a challenge to me before I would ever rise up and defend what I believe to be the truth. He said that he could just pull anything out at random. Well, that's exactly what we've had. We're in the fourth night of your random pulling out from any and everywhere. 
It's really been a dandy. Now, let me give him some questions since he was nice enough. Finally, took him four nights to give me some questions. Number one, please show us the passage specifying the point of faith. Now, he'll finally get around to it as he always does. The passage that specifies the point of faith. Number two, in each case in the New Testament where one is called a believer, is that person in salvation due to faith alone when he is pictured as a believer? Number three, please cite the passage of Scripture stating that one believes into Christ. Now, not believes on Christ, not believes in Christ, that is, Christ as the Messiah, but believes into Christ, that because of his belief, he's moved into Christ because of it. Number four, please explain for us the difference in in order to obtain the remission of sins, in order to have your sins forgiven by good speed, with a view to the remission of sins by Weymouth. Number five, since you produced a tract claiming that if baptism is essential to salvation and a man did the baptizing, then we've got a man mediator between man and God. It's over there on his table. Now, if you then make baptism a matter of Christian duty, don't you still, in the realm of Christian duty, have a man as a mediator between you and God and all of your Christian duty? Notice what it says. Within five minutes, one can be baptized. He says, that's awful because you're using a man and you've got a man mediator. So he moves baptism over in the realm of Christian duty, which one must do all of his life, and he's got a man mediator there as long as he lives in his acts of Christian service. Number six. Is your view of salvation at the point of faith the same as that of Sam Morris, Albert Garner, Hoyt Chastain, all Baptist preachers, and salvation that continues regardless of the behavior of the believer? And I will give their, the statements to the audience in just a moment. Give those to him, please. Now, my time is running, and let me give the statement. Now, he wants to show you what a true believer is in terms of his doctrine. Now, these are the statements. These are the statements. Sam Morris, Baptist preacher. A Christian's sins from adultery to murder do not endanger his soul. Now, when Garland Elkins mentioned that, Brother Elkins had it on the chart, and there was a statement and then something that didn't pertain to the matter of the endangerment to the soul and brother Elkins had a dot 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 this man just raised a fit you've got a dot 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 there and it's not the full context well when he got up there and then explained and it's in the Elkins Ross debate pages 273 274 he got up there as if it, the man had been misused in some way and now the explanation was that such a man who commits who's a Christian and commits adultery arranging all the way down to murder he'll lose a little of his joy He'll lose a little of his influence. He'll lose a little. I knew he was going to get that. If, Mr. Moderator, it's in the Elkins Ross debate, 273 and 274, the pages, and he's got a copy. There's a chart on page 273. I thought I gave the page numbers when I started this. Here's the thing. On these kind of things, he can point those out. In the next speech, Mr. Ross can ask for it because you're interrupting the train of thought of this audience. Well, yes. Thank you. Yes, I was doing what I was asked to do by my partner. Thank you. Okay. Well, you don't have a copy of the Elkins Cross debate, Mr. Is it Ross? Job, is it legitimate to call a point of order in a debate, sir? We're not going to have needless points of order unless you want to turn the audience to... Who asks and who's judge of what's needless? Who's the judge of what's needless and what isn't? We're going to let the audience decide, but now... The audience is not the moderator. He's the, the moderator. The audience isn't the moderators. We are. Now we're getting around to that which is the general practice. We've had three <laughs> nights. It's been very pleasant. Now, the full statement, Mr. Ross knows it. It's in that debate. Mr. Ross is all quoting then of that part that he accused that Brother Elkins left out, the dot, 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 that such a man loses some of his joy, some of his influence, some of his relationship with God. 
And it doesn't make any difference if a man lose a little, a little of his zip out of his zippy de doo da or a little dip out of his dipsy doodle. The point is the man said that from the, that kind of behavior, you do not endanger your soul. Mr. Albert Garner, also quoted, a child of God can die drunk and when pressed, even hating God, and still go to heaven. Mr. Hoyt Chastain, my evidence for this, you have it in that debate, but I was present and heard every word of it. Mr. Hoyt Chastain, when pressed, said that a man can leave his wife, run off with a 16-year-old girl, commit adultery, and die in adultery, and then he was asked, but he still goes to heaven, he says, certainly. Now my question to Mr. Ross, the last one that I gave him, is that the true Baptist believer that you are presenting before us in this debate? Now my answer to his questions. Is it scriptural for the church of Christ to have a president? No. And whoever said that in a past time or in present time, you can have him along with Rubel Shelley. Since you claim the Church of Christ has a position of finality on its teachings and practice, does this mean the church never changes? Doctrine never changes. I don't know that I said the Church of Christ has a position on finality. You can find some kooky folks that wear the name of Christ, even the, uh, the Church of Christ, even today. We will not support them when they leave the New Testament. It's the New Testament that has the position of finality. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 tells us all to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. It's the New Testament that has the, uh, the position of finality. Did you believe into Ace Christ before you were baptized into Ace Christ for the remission of sins? No, I believed in Christ and I believed on Christ and I was baptized into Christ. If you believe into ace Christ before you were baptized well I've just answered that but the point is was it a living faith or a dead faith faith is always a living faith when it begins it's a living faith it only becomes a dead faith as James speaks of it if one ceases to let faith do the work that God demands that it do at that time and that's exactly what James is saying at that time if that faith will not do what that faith that God sets forth requires of him then it's called a dead faith in that it does not accomplish the desired end not that it wasn't living at the point of faith not that it wasn't living if it did one or two things that God requires but if it stops and refuses to do something God said that's exactly how James uses it do you agree with J.W. McGarvey that faith is dead until one obeys water baptism yes in the sense as James describes it that's what McGarvey was talking about he never did say that if one believes what the Bible says, he thus has faith in it that that's dead. He is giving the picture that if one finds out that baptism is essential, required, and then one possessing that faith will not be baptized, will not obey the Lord's will, that that's dead faith. Did you believe on Epi Christ prior to water baptism? I believed on Christ, and I believed in Christ as the Savior, but I was baptized into Christ. Now, you're talking about being out of soap. He still forgot what night it was. We've had a treatise on history, a president of the church, the school, the elders, the restoration movement, which we've already dealt with, a booklet I, I wrote, and he tries to liken any literature that's written by someone simply giving a sermon or comments on a passage of scripture, he's likening that to a creed, his confession of faith. Colossians 2 and 22 says, after the doctrines and commandments of men, these things are to perish with the using. He mentioned William A. Men and what Scott had to say about it and wants me to get back in the church history. William A. Men, long since dead, I could hardly care what he said or did. Scott has long since been dead. He is not my reference point. 1710, he got back to the road marker. I believe that was the basis on which he was supposed to give me that set of commentaries, wasn't it? or sermons, if I could prove that that was a church of Christ? Well, I gave him one older than that, 1669, that British congregation. If I deserved a set of Spurgeon's sermons based on 1710, when I gave him even better evidence, I certainly ought to get it in the bookcase thrown in. Interesting on that point, there sits Brother Ken Chumley, English preacher, who visited the current Baptist pastor of that Tottle Bank church 
And in conversation with him, that Baptist pastor said, in reality, you folks own this building. You see, it became a Baptist church after it apostatized from the faith. And when you apostatize from the faith, you might become Baptist or something else. Diotrephes bothered him. My point was, here's a man that sees the preeminence. That's what John said. I think in Baptist churches, the pastor has that preeminence. Translation, he slipped and said, translation, for unto. Did you hear him say unto? Well, we're closer than he thinks we are. If he says unto the remission of sins, finally got around to his proposition and brought up the matter of faith only. And remember, he put his proposition sheet up there and launched into Jackson for uh, bringing up faith only. It wasn't anywhere on the proposition sheet, the matter of faith only. Give me my J24. He says, these do not always mean the same thing. Well... I imagine that's true. You could work, work up some situation where only and alone do not mean the same thing, but it so happens they mean the same thing in James. They're synonyms, not the same word. James 2, only, alone. James 2, 17, alone. James 2, 24, only, alone, only, merely. James 2, 24, Thayer, page 418. It's used as a synonymous expression, both of those words in Webster and also used in Thayer. I know you can dream up cases, but I'm not dreaming up cases. I'm simply telling you how James used the two, and he used them as interchangeable terms. He made the statement, you know, we believe that faith comes first and works follow. Well, you sure are not moving over to our position. We believe that. We believe you must have faith first, and then those works follow. He quoted Galatians 5 and 6, that faith worketh by love. Well, we believe that. I don't know what his point is. All right, here's B12, please, and hold my time. Two twelve, wasn't it 212? Blessings promised of faith, every blessing promised in any verse of Scripture which mentions baptism, in other verses it's promised of faith without any consideration of baptism. Now, brethren, what does that mean? That means that he lays down the verses and he finds out that if there's a blessing attached to faith, he picks and chooses and takes the faith and leaves the others aside. Which meant then he could find a passage where blessing is promised of faith, therefore he wouldn't have to repent. Blessing is promised of faith, therefore he wouldn't have to confess Christ. In other words, it's a pick-and-choose kind of doctrine. He will not take the summation of what the Lord says concerning that which is required. Now, please give me my faith, uh, my chart, my faith. Don't give me his. My chart, J45, please. Now, he's going to try to tell you that at that point of faith, he'll finally get around to saying it because it does in dozens of instances, at that point of faith, you have got it. You are saved. Look at John 1, 12. This is going to haunt him all of this night. Here is belief or faith that enabled but did not save of itself. Notice John 1 and 12. As many as believed on him, to them God gave them power to become sons of God. Didn't make them sons of God when they believed. Didn't make them sons of God when they had that faith. As many as believed, God gave them power to become the sons of God. They believe on his name. And God gave them power to become sons of God. There's their faith. There's the power. Romans 1, 16, the gospel which is to be obeyed, that they might have the salvation and be the sons of God. They obey the gospel of their salvation. Ephesians 1 and 13 Faith enables one to become the sons of God. Now, don't forget to tie that in with what you're saying about faith, Mr. Ross. J-22, please. Mr. Ross, in one of his letters to me, said, if you will look on one of my books on page number whatever it was, I think I've got it down there, if you look on page number 71, I'll give you passages that state the blessings are to faith alone. Now, notice. And he's got the quotation marks up there, but it doesn't make any difference. Faith alone, I think there are 12 of those statements, and folks, this is the truth of it. That word alone is not in a single one of those verses. 
I'd never say anything about anybody perverting the scriptures or anybody misusing anything. Bob Ross added that word alone to every one of those statements. Not a one of those verses says faith alone. He's not familiar with the synecdoche, but in 1 Peter 3 and 21, baptism doth also now save us. Does he believe that baptism saves, but faith is not required? We happen to believe in the figure of speech known as synecdoche. And notice that this covers the range of things that one requires. Matthew 10 and 32, those that confess the Lord, the Lord will confess them. Well, you confess the Lord. Does that mean you don't have to repent? You don't have to have faith? Nothing else? 1 John 4 and 7, everyone that loveth is born of God. Does that mean then you love, but you don't have to have the faith? You don't have to confess? You don't have to repent? Oh, he doesn't like the synecdoche, does it? J37. By faith, there's the faith that in the Bible is referred to as the system of God. It's always true, always has been, is so in every dispensation that every man that ever has pleased God, every man that ever has been saved, every man that's been in relationship to God has been there because of his faith, been there because of God's love for him, been there because of God's mercy, been there because of God's grace, but also been there because of the faith. It's so in every dispensation, in Hebrews 11, you have all three dispensations there, men in the patriarchal age, men in the Mosaic age, and written for people in the Christian age. Faith, the system of God and the individual must have always had faith, depending on the law that was given him at the time. Now, individual faith, that's the persuasion, the conviction, the trust, the confidence. And notice that there under pistis, Faith, page 511, and please look it up. Let's have your comment on it. Under describing faith, he says, it is conjoined with obedience to Christ. Well, he could have said faith only, faith alone, faith by itself. Thayer says it's conjoined with obedience to Christ. Then on page 5, 513, the same word, obedience rendered plus the faith. Ties the obedience to the faith. Interesting that one of their favorite books in all the Bible to where they can hammer on faith alone by inserting it just as he did is Romans. Romans 1 and 5, the book virtually begins by referring to obedience to the faith. The book ends in chapter 16 and verse number 26, uh, stressing the need for obedience of faith. And then he's got the audacity to stand up and say, that it is a matter of salvation by faith alone and will always put down obedience regarding uh, planning uh, and then executing the plan that God has for the saving of man. Now, my chart number J43. Now, he will speak of the point of faith, and I'd like for him to show us where it is. Knowing that Jesus was born, knowing that he's the Son of God, knowing that he's deity, knowing that he lived as an example, knowing that he was to die, knowing that he did die, knowing that he shed his blood, knowing of the gospel message, hearing the gospel message, believing the facts of the gospel, repenting of sins, confessing Jesus as Christ. What passage speaks of the point of faith and where in all of that does a man finally arrive at the point of faith? Now, Mr. Ross... You've only got two more speeches left. Now, you can jump to the Southwest School of Bible Studies. You can romp around and find some idiot that thought there was a president of the church. You can refer to the elders. You can talk about the restoration movement all you want to. But time is running out. Better get to your proposition. Long past, it's time to do that. And please let us know in those states. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. and filed this down here at the state of Texas. Bill, I'd suggest you get hold of that. What do you call him, an idiot? Him, he done wrong. He's president of the corporation called Southwest Church of Christ. And uh, you know what they were doing at that time? They were changing the church government over here over from trustees to elders. 
Up until that time, they'd been governed by trustees. And then they go down here and they tell the state, we're going to change our government over to a body of elders. And then we're going to change from being just a 50-year church. They first of all said they were going to last 50 years. Going to be a 50-year church. And then they decided they could last a little longer. So they went down and changed it and said, well, we're going to be perpetual. And then they went and changed the name. They had a name, and they changed that. And uh, I don't know what became of this president here, Mr. Taylor. But anyway, they, they've had a president here. And, and I've, I wondered, well, now, and why didn't Bill bring that out when he's talking about the government of the church the other night? You know, I knew when he got up here talking like that, I could catch him in this contradiction because there's not a single thing essential to being a denomination that the church of which this man's a member doesn't possess. I challenge him to name one attribute essential to being a denomination that his church doesn't possess. And this is one of them, going down here and incorporating and offering articles of faith. Got articles of faith written down here, what they believe. Now, Bill, if you just believe the Bible, why didn't you just give them a Bible and say, that's our articles of faith? But he's got down here what he calls fundamentals. Here are the fundamentals. Of course, we call it statement of faith and declaration of faith. Bill wouldn't like that. You see, that'd be sectarian. You're denominational if you do that. So he's got down here the basic fundamentals, basic fundamental principles. And he's got A, and he's got B, and he's got C, and he's got D. And you know what D says? New Testament doctrine, that they'll be able to teach the Bible with or without lesson helps, lesson aids, and commentaries. Now, isn't that something? Putting that in your articles of faith. And then he's got, uh, now, if you're believing the premillennial return, though, you can't join our church. Even got that in there. And he says he's got no creed. He says he's got no statement of faith. He says he's got no confession of faith. Well, what do you call this? Oh, that's basic fundamentals. Basic fundamentals. Bill, you've been watching too much Laurel and Hardy. See what a mess, how is it he says that? See what a mess you got me into? Well, uh, I don't know uh, what he's gonna say about the idiot or about the other things that I brought out here, but it says right there, down here at the state of Texas, they had a president here at one time. I don't know what became of him. Now, he says, uh, the restoration train, what did he say about that? Well, we're going to have a little song after the debate tonight. If you want to hang around here and sing it, we're going to put it on our video. Bill can have it on his if he wants it, but he might not appreciate our singing. But we're going to put it on our video. Uh, now, put me up Romans uh, 6 for uh, Haldane. You know, he could have read a little bit more there in Romans from Haldane. Uh, let's look at that. Uh, what page have we got there, brother? 461? Look at here what he's got. Is that the one? No, I want that loose one. Yeah, I want the loose one. What page is that? Look at here, he had Romans 6, 3, and 4, and all he did was read the, read the Bible. Now, he brought Haldane up here and offered him as one of his restoration pioneers. Now, what are you laughing about? The man had him on his chart. The man had his name on his chart and said he was one of his restoration leaders. Now, I've got the man's book here and asked him to read the book, and he can't even read anything that he agrees with but the, the verse that the man's commenting on. The man's a Calvinist. And look at here. Baptized into Jesus Christ, he read something about baptism. By faith, believers are made one with Christ. They become members of his body. The oneness is represented emblematically by baptism. Represented. The believer is one with Christ as truly as he was one with Adam. Now let's go up here to the top of this next page. Look at here. The figure of baptism was very early mistaken for a reality, just like Bill mistakes it now. 
And accordingly, some of the fathers speak of the baptized person as truly born again in the water like Bill does. They supposed him to get into the water with all his sins upon him and to come out of it without them. This indeed is the case with baptism figuratively, but the carnal mind, such as Bill Jackson possesses, soon turned the figure into a reality. It appears to be the impatience of man to, what's that word? <laughs> Tedious and ineffectual, a way to wait on God's method of converting sinners by His Holy Spirit through the truth. Now that's Robert Haldane, and he had him on his chart number. What was it? I had it put up there a while ago. And this, this Robert Haldane was supposed to be a restoration movement man. Robert Haldane was a great Baptist preacher from Scotland, and Alexander Campbell knew him before he ever came to America. And as long as Campbell fellowship with Robert Haldane, Campbell stayed in the truth. But then Campbell came to America and got over here and got sidetracked and started this so-called restoration movement, and that's why I was able to draw that train of his choo-choo coming down the track the restoration line. But as long as he stayed over there in Scotland with this man, Robert Haldane, he was sound in the faith, believed in Calvinism, the sovereignty of God, and election. Got over here and he somehow got sidetracked. Let's have that on the Haldane on the sovereignty of God now. This is what Bill, he, he just loves to chew on Calvinism. He's just been chomping the bits to get a bite of it. Well, Bill, I'm going to give you a little Calvinism here. From your man, Mr. Haldane, so-called. Look here. He even quotes John Calvin up here, Bill. Robert Haldane. You want to race him off your chart? Next time you put that chart up, you want to race him off? Look at all these Calvinistic statements here. Look at them. He predestinated some to salvation, others to eternal damnation. Now that's your Robert Haldane that you brought up here and presented, Bill. He said he was a restoration movement man. Said he was a friend of Campbell. And here's his doctrine. Look at it. Predestinated some to salvation. The second proposition, now he goes on down here. Let's read this. The Lord in his gratuitous election is free and unrestrained by the necessity of bestowing the same grace equally on all. Well, I've got three charts filled with this man's statements, and I brought them for Bill. If he wants to use them, let him use them. Three charts of Calvinism, if he wants to refute Calvinism, from Robert Haldane. Leave them out there for him to use. Now let's go on. He says, uh, he wants the questions answered. Number one, point of faith, John 3, 18, or any one of those passages I had up there. Number two, due to faith, Number three, believe in the Christ. I'll have that one up here in just a moment. My chart on that. <clears throat> and then where's number four? Let's see, here it is. Number two, yes. Number three, I'm going to comment on believe in the Christ with my chart. Number four, we discussed that Tuesday night and he's not satisfied and wants me to get off on it again. Number five, there's one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. Now number six, Sam Morris. Well, I'll get to... Sam Morris, maybe, let's see. Second speech. Give me my Sam Morris chart. I don't want to get up here and not be able to come back on this one. This Sam Morris thing, give me the chart number. I meet this in every debate and answer it in every debate. I, did, I answered it in the Elkins debate. They never do give you the original Sam Morris chart. They pervert it, distort it in every way they can. Let's put it up here and read it. These and, let's see, these and many other scriptures teach that man's salvation and the justification of his soul depend entirely upon his faith in Christ. The sin question is a son question. Salvation is a trust question. Damnation a disbelief question. All the prayers a man may pray. Now he's not talking about a child of God. He's not talking about a man that's a Christian. He says all the prayers a man may pray. All the Bibles he may read all the churches he may belong to, all the services he may attend, all the sermons he may practice, all the debts he may pay, all the ordinances he may observe, all the laws he may keep, all the benevolent acts he may perform will not make his soul one whit safer. What's he saying? A man who's a sinner cannot save his own soul. 
That's what he's saying. And all the sins he may commit from idolatry to murder will not make his soul in any more danger. Why? Because he's lost if he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ and it doesn't matter if he's a murderer or an adulterer or whatever, he's still lost. Now they, they present that like Sam Morris is talking about a child of God. He's talking about salvation of a lost man. Now let me have a next chart, brother. I'll show you how they pervert this. Show you how they distort it. Put it up here. Let's see, this is a spiritual sword, Thomas Warren. Now look right down here. Raise it up so they can see it. Raise it up. Look at here. See this, the child of God? That's not in this original track. Here's the track, Sam Morris. Thomas Warren put in here, the Bible does not teach that all the sins of he, parenthesis, the child of God. That's not in this track, friends. That's a deliberate, ungodly misrepresentation. This guy Warren, I've had my fill of him. He'll lie about anybody. He lied about me. He wrote in his paper that all I did was call them Campbellites up at Parkersburg. Well, I didn't have the book at the time, and I sure wasn't going to sit down and listen to that whole debate to see if I called them Camelites all the time. So I constantly called them Camelites. Well, finally, when the book came out, I went through it, and you know how many times I used that word? Four times. And most of the times it was simply in the context because Elkins had brought it up. And Warren just lied about it. And he's lying about Sam Morris. If he's here tonight, I'd tell him to his face he's a liar. Now let's have the next one. Look at this one. Look here. Sam Morris, Baptist preacher, said he left out the beginning lines right here. Left it out. Look down here. He left out a significant completion of a point right down here. Look up here. Omission. Right up here. Omission right down here. And I told Garland Elkins, I said, I'll take this track and debate it with you if you want to debate it. He wouldn't do it. Oh, no, he wants to chop it up, put in some dots and leave out some things. All right, now let's get 264. 264. Now, I could answer all these men like that, but why waste my time on Sam or uh, Chastain and what was the other one? Brother Garner. Now... 264, and this will answer one of his questions, by the way. Greek preposition with believing, baptized. Ice is used with respect to, or the meaning with respect to, with reference to, and look here. It's used with baptized in Matthew 28, 19, Mark 1, 4, Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, 3, Galatians 3, 27. It's used with believe in John 1, 12, 2, 23, 3, 16, 18, 36, 4, 39, 6, 29, 35, 48, 30, and so on. Now look, he's talking about believe into Christ. Here you have it. Right here. Believe into Christ. Right here, Bill. Ice, same word, right? Same word as baptize. Used with baptize. Ice, believe. Now there it is. Question for Mr. Jackson. Does one believe ice Christ in the same sense that one is baptized ice Christ? Now that's a rhetorical question that he won't touch. I asked him on the question about it, and he didn't say he believed I as Christ, did he? He said he believed in Christ, and he believed on Christ, but he did not say he believed I as Christ. Get up here and tell us, do you believe I as Christ, Bill? Now, look at it. Look at the question. This is important. Question for Mr. Jackson. Does one believe I as Christ? In the same sense that one is baptized, I is Christ. Now he's going to have some chewing on that one, I guarantee you. Now look at Epi. Look at Epi. He cannot get on Christ himself. Look here. Down here. Not used with baptized. He cannot get baptized on Christ. It's used with belief in these passages right here. No, both ice and epi are used in Romans 5, 2. Now, coming down here, I'm having to hurry through this because of my time. Maybe I'll come back to it later. One who believes gets on or upon Christ by faith, not by baptism. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot get on or up on Jesus Christ by baptism. 
comes by faith. That's why I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved is an experience that comes before baptism. And look at the definition of this by the Greek scholars up here. Robertson says, implies a resting upon. Root meaning is on or upon, according to Dana and Manny. And it's not used with baptized. You do not get baptized on Christ. He that believeth on him, epi, is not condemned. He that believeth on him, epi, hath everlasting life. You can't get baptized on him for no condemnation. That's why Garland Elkins never would say he believed on Christ to no condemnation because he never did believe on him to no condemnation. Now, Bill, I want, I want to press it again. I asked you the question, and you didn't, you didn't say you were baptized I ask Christ or believe I ask Christ. Does one believe I ask Christ in the same sense that one is baptized I ask Christ? You'll have your hands full of that. Give me 265. Thank you. 265. Will Mr. Jackson take the verses and believe them as they are stated? In his TV program January the 12th, Jackson said, Ross would not take the verses on baptism and believe them as they are stated. Ross will take every verse in the Bible on any subject as stated. The question is, will Mr. Jackson, for example, one believes I Christ, John 3, 18. Will Mr. Jackson accept it? Does he believe that one believes in order to obtain Christ? Does one who believes I's Christ obtain Christ? If one obtains Christ by believing, is it dead faith? Give me my next chart. Is Jackson a hyper Camelite? Look at here. Can one be saved before and without water baptism? Campbell answers, there is no occasion then for making immersion on a profession of faith absolutely essential to a Christian. Are there other Christians besides restorationists? Campbell says, I have no idea of adding to the catalog of new sects. I labor to see sectarianism abolished and all Christians of every name united upon the one foundation upon which the apostolic church was founded. To bring Baptist and pedo-Baptist to this is my supreme end. Get it? All Christians of every name, Baptist and pedo-Baptist are included. Now, they always, always expect me to say Camelite, so I thought I'd get it in to please him. Number 24, where's Alex? Alexander Campbell's faith and baptism. One cannot be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ unless he's baptized in order to be saved, says Thomas Warren. Alexander Campbell claimed to be saved in Scotland before he came to America. Alexander Campbell was immersed in 1812, but not in order to be saved. Therefore, according to Warren, Campbell was not saved. Give me number 15. Is the Church of Christ a denomination? I challenge Mr. Jackson to name one thing which is essential being denomination which is not characteristic of the Church of Christ Church. One minute. I challenge him to name one thing which is essential qualification for being a sect which is not true of the Church of Christ sect. I challenge him to name one thing which is essential to being a cult that is not true of the segment of the Church of Christ of which he is a member. Note the following parallels to the points used by Alan Hires against United Pentecostal Church, points which equally apply to the Church of Christ. Every point in this list against the United Pentecostal Church applies against the Church of Christ of which Mr. Jackson is a member. Now give me 121 if i got time for it right quick. Here's a Church of Christ that uh, uh, in, back in England, and give me the next chart. I want to get this one. Church of Christ, you know, just give me the next chart. Before the foundation of the world, God did elect a certain number of men to everlasting salvation whom he did predestinate to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. And it was a church of Christ believed in the doctrine of eternal election. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you.